Good evening. I'm Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller University, and I am delighted to welcome you to the presentation of the university's 2021 Lewis Thomas Prize for writing about science, honoring the scientist as poet. Tonight, I have the great privilege of presenting this year's award to Dr. Richard O. Prum. This year's presentation is necessarily virtual, but we are joined by graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, faculty, trustees, and benefactors, as well as literature and science enthusiasts for our 26th presentation of the Lewis Thomas Prize. Scientific concepts and advances are often complex, and the language of communication among scientists is frequently inaccessible to the general public. As a result, discoveries that are important for the health of individuals, societies, and the planet are often mischaracterized, misunderstood, or denied. Moreover, we as scientists find the incredible beauty both in the process of discovering new truths about nature and in the truths themselves, features that we too infrequently communicate to non-scientists. The Lewis Thomas Prize was established in 1993 to honor those rare individuals who, through their writing, effectively introduce scientific knowledge into public discourse, and particularly those whose writing also evokes reflection, revelation, and wonder in the natural world. The prize is named for its first recipient, Lewis Thomas. His book, the Lives of a Cell, Notes of a Biology Watcher, a collection of thought-provoking essays on science, nature, and human biology, received the National Book Award for nonfiction in both the arts and letters and science categories in 1975. The Lewis Thomas Prize has been awarded to scientists whose writing has illuminated a wide range of fields. These include molecular biologist Francois Jacob, cosmologist Martin Rees, sociobiologist E.O. Wilson, psychologist K. Redfield Jameson, physiologist Francis Ashcroft, mathematicians Ian Stewart and Stephen Strogatz, oceanographer Sylvia Earle, and Nobel Prize winning physicist Kip Thorne. Most recently, the prize was awarded to oncologist Sid Mukherjee in 2019. And I'm proud to say tonight's honoree continues in this wonderful tradition. The prize recipients are selected by a jury, including distinguished scientists and authors. This year's prize jury was chaired by Jesse Ausubel with members Diane Ackerman, Jan Breslow, Anna Fells, Tom Sackmar, Dava Sobel, and Jonathan Wiener. I'd like to thank Jesse and the selection committee for their efforts and their insightful selection of this year's prize winner. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce the recipient of the 2021 Lewis Prize Thomas Prize winner, Dr. Richard O. Prum, who is recognized for his remarkable book, The Evolution of Beauty. One day when Richard Prum was in third grade, he put on his sister's glasses as a joke. It was only then that he realized, wait a minute, I need glasses. He soon got them and the world came into focus. What sparked his interest in birds rather than other visual wonders was a field guide that he stumbled upon while browsing in a bookstore. He was captivated and begged his mother to buy the book for him, which she did for his 10th birthday, and his lifelong adventure began. He became an avid birder who befriended people who shared his interest, many of whom were retired and conveniently for him were able to drive. By the time he started undergraduate studies at Harvard, he was set on becoming an ornithologist. He figured he'd become a wildlife refuge manager or a forest ranger. But in a freshman seminar course, Dr. Prum discovered the field of evolution and was again captivated and has studied birds ever since and combined these interests with the study of evolution. Like Charles Darwin, he headed for the tropics after finishing his bachelor's degree, spending six months in the Suriname rainforest he paid particular, uh, particular attention to mannequins, bird species in which the males perform extraordinarily elaborate group dance routines to attract mates. He went on to perform his PhD research at the University of Michigan, where he reconstructed the evolution of mannequin courtship behaviors. Dr. Prum joined the faculty at the University of Kansas in 1991 and is recruited, was recruited to Yale in 2004 where he is now the William Robertson Co. Professor of Ornithology in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. 
He is also head curator of vertebrate zoology in the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. He has received numerous awards for his research, including a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. His deep knowledge of birds has led him to many unique contributions, ranging from the evolution of feathers to the mechanism of non-iridescent scattering, light scattering that gives bluebirds their color. And by identifying distinctive pigment granules in dinosaur feathers, he was able to reconstruct the colored plumage of a dinosaur. His work continues to span the gamut of bird development, evolution, and behavior as he turns his eye to topics that spark his imagination. Dr. Prum felt compelled to write his book, The Evolution of Beauty, <clears throat> because the field of evolution was giving short shrift to an explanation of many elaborate, spectacular, and flamboyant characteristics of animals, particularly birds, but also humans. He wanted to disrupt the conviction that natural selection is solely about fitness. The evolution of beauty argues for a different mechanism, one that was in fact originally proposed by Darwin himself. Darwin's first book on the origin of species made the transformative proposal that evolutionary change is driven by natural selection, often called survival of the fittest, in which organisms that are better suited to their environment have survival advantage and will leave more offspring, which if these beneficial traits are heritable, will continue to survive better and leave more offspring than other members of the species that lack these traits. But in Darwin's subsequent book on evolution, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, he wrote about sexual selection in which he proposed a second form <clears throat> of selection driven by individuals of one sex choosing a mate based on traits that are simply appealing to the opposite sex independent of their supposed fitness. Traits arising via sexual selection evolve simply because of aesthetic desires. In nature, Dr. Prum contends, beauty happens in significant part because females select males they deem attractive. <clears throat> Furthermore, these choices extend the female's tastes to future generations uh, when the traits can be passed on to their offspring. Dr. Prum criticizes faith in the universal power of survival of the fittest to control the outcomes of evolution and challenges the notion that sexually attractive traits indicate fitness. According to mainstream thinking, appealing attributes or behaviors reflect utility even if scientists have no idea what the connection might be. This assumption that beauty indicates a survival advantage is mistaken, Dr. Prum says. Instead, beauty evolves for its own sake, and the male peacock's elaborate plumage simply reflects what female peacocks like and desire. Although certain traits signal good genes, Dr. Prum maintains it is folly to make the assumption that this is a general truth. The idea of, se of sexual selection has riled scientists from the start. Even Darwin's Victorian supporters were aghast that he ascribed such powers of discernment to mere animals, and perhaps even worse, to women. The evolution of beauty makes the case for aesthetic evolution, weaving Dr. Prum's research findings into a compelling case that sparkles with his gift of, for description, which truly comes to life when he's in the field observing, for example, a courting male great Argus pheasant, who by displaying his plumage creates the illusion for his potential mate of a field of golden orbs floating before a rich tapestry. The writing is vivid, lyrical, and many times funny. Dr. Prum extends his argument beyond birds by applying aesthetic evolution to human traits. He is especially interested in applying lessons from ornithology to ourselves because he objects to the notion that every deviation in our appearance from some ideal indicates a genetic flaw. Children, especially young women, grow up immersed in this thinking, and this belief has a, can have a deeply distorting and damaging effect on our view of our bodies. Prum would like to help dispel these attitudes. Dr. Prum remains an eager bird watcher who still draws inspiration from seeing the animals in the wild. He has spotted about 45% of the world's 10,000 bird species and is now hatching plans to tick off many more species as we emerge from the COVID pandemic. It is usually my privilege to present the Lewis Thomas Medal and the citation to our winner. Instead, they have, these have already been sent to Dr. Prum in advance so he can have them for this evening. 
and it is now my great pleasure to read the citation on this award. By feeding the curiosity about birds with meticulous field work, open-mindedness, and creative thinking, Richard Prum has broken new ground in ornithology and far afield. His approach is as bold as his ideas. He has harnessed disparate disciplines to apply whatever methodology and expertise will best illuminate the issue at hand. His discoveries about the behavior, anatomy, and evolution of birds have spotlighted unanticipated truths of nature and have shaken dogma. In his book, The Evolution of Beauty, Dr. Prum argues that female birds manifest their aesthetic tastes in mate choice, selecting the males that they find most alluring. Female taste exerts a powerful force in evolution and is responsible for many of animals' most striking, exotic, and attractive characteristics. With verve and wit, Dr. Prum delivers a wry account of the 150-year scientific quarrel about this idea, dissecting the sexist ob objections of Victorian critics and the arguments of modern researchers who contend that males' over-the-top traits must indicate strength and vitality. Dr. Prum transports readers to the rainforest of Suriname and other far-flung locations where he has performed his research. His prose takes flight when he describes the appearance and behavior of birds. Richard Prum vividly conveys the intricacy and beauty of nature, as well as the excitement of trying to understand it. His gift for bringing to life subjects as diverse as bower birds decorating choices and scientists intellectual wrangling makes him an exemplary recipient of the Lewis Thomas Prize. Presented this evening to Richard O. Prum, PhD. Congratulations, Rick. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, first, uh, thanks very much to uh, President Lipton for uh, your kind uh, introduction of lovely words. I really appreciate it. And thanks very much to Rockefeller University and to the Lewis Thomas Prize Committee uh, for, this, uh, for this honor, uh, especially to uh, Jesse Ausubel and Nathaniel Rudder, uh, who never imagined uh, in fall of 2019 that they would have to plan this entire event twice <laughs> in order to have it happen. Um, uh, indeed, uh, when we uh, postponed for an entire year, we had no way of knowing that we would still be uh, uh, doing it on Zoom anyway. Um, now, in the week uh, before I received uh, the, um, the uh, award letter from, from, uh, from Rick in, in, uh, in 2019, I was actually considering a new uh, writing project of my own. And I, I was actually could say, how do you write a small book a small effective book about biology. And my mind suddenly came to Lives of the Cell and I actually walked across my office and found my undergraduate copy <laughs> uh, purchased for $1.50 in, uh, in, in probably 1980. Uh, and, um, and I perused it as I, I was considering this challenge. So it was uh, a week later uh, sitting on my messy desk uh, when the letter arrived, and that seemed uh, 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 really, really appropriate. Um, um, and uh, I guess now that they have this, uh, received this award, I have to start thinking of myself as a writer, um, a, a, in addition to scientist. I, I don't think I'm going to get to poet any, anytime soon. But, um, um, you know, I, I, I a few years ago on an airplane, a conversation with a random person, somebody asked me, oh, are you a writer? And, and I, at that point I was uh, working on birds in South America and phylogenetics and, and uh, structural color. And I hadn't thought of myself as a writer, but indeed uh, scientists are writers. And that is the way we report our work and it's part of all of our daily lives. Um, I think though, at this point we have to realize or recognize that uh, most scientists, uh, most science writing, including my own, is bad writing. Uh, and that uh, writing effectively well for different audiences um, requires something that we're not used to. Um, we all, scientists, myself especially, I, I love that devastating, uh, there are three hypotheses, no, no, four hypotheses that explain this and, and, and going through them point by point. But of course, uh, nobody wants to read that devastatingly effective argument except other scientists. 
so in in writing the evolution of beauty i had to uh, uh, learn to write in a new way and uh, and learn to be effective in a new way and instrumental in in that process uh were my editors uh chris poapolo at, at doubleday and beth rashbaum who worked tirelessly over many drafts over years uh, to 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 craft uh, what became uh, the evolution of beauty. Um, uh, you know, the editing is an art form, and what uh, uh, Chris and Beth did uh, was to practice this art in a special way, uh, which was to make me sound more like myself. Um, they uh, allowed me to, or taught me how to be. Uh, uh, take the science, uh, take my scientific self, uh, you know, uh, uh, out of, or my scientific mind out of the organizing of the writing uh, to put my own self, my own experience, my scientific experience, as well as my personal experience in, into the writing. And, uh, um, and uh, I really taught, they taught me uh, uh, something I didn't know I was capable of doing. And so uh, I don't doubt, I have no doubt that I would not be here today without uh, Chris and Beth's um, uh, helpful guidance. And uh, uh, for them, to them, I'm, I'm, I'm truly, truly grateful. Now, I, I won't give a, a, a genuine uh, book talk. I just want to talk uh, uh, about um, uh, the general ideas of the, of the book, introduce it for, 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 for those, and, uh, and also, um, her displays are so graphical, I, I, I can't resist uh, 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 exploring them. So um, I think the, the, the first thing I want to note is that uh, this is an example of, uh, of, uh, of bird watching science, that my work really does grow organically and personally and directly out of my experience as, as a bird watcher. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm proud to note that uh, on uh, the, the subtitle uh, of uh, The Lives of the Cell is Notes of a Biology Watcher. So Lewis Thomas in his work was uh, uh, claiming the same sort of frame that uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, his own subjectivity, his own observation as, uh, as part of, uh, of, of, of science. So that aspect of bird watching science is, is key. And, and, and what I think is important to, to state in, in, a, in, a, in a context of a scientific community like this is that that, that science is really a kind of natural history uh, and uh, 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 um, a, a different way to frame the scientific enterprise, right? Um, and natural history is a, a, a scientific method of investigation uh, that is uh, located in, in a certain place or certain bird species, a certain uh, galaxy, a certain uh, uh, geological fault. Uh, these are all kinds of natural history. And um, natural history isn't framed specifically around getting generalizations that we think of it in, in, in science uh, as uh, maybe our, uh, our, our, uh, our, 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 our goals, but it often un uncovers them along the way. And so, uh, uh, natural history is, to borrow the term, uh, uh, the phrase of uh, uh, Donna Haraway, a kind of situated knowledge. Now, in to those of you who work on on uh, 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 model organisms or canonical uh, pathways, uh, you might classify this as somebody who really knows the system. They know their system, right? Uh, but knowing the system when it is not a, a, a model or a controlled situation, when it comes from nature or uh, the world, uh, is, is a different kind of pursuit. And, and, and so part of my goal here is to, is to, to bring natural history into, in, into focus. So, so this is uh, my, uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, goal is to, 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 on, 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 uh, uh, to, to bring back natural history into the sciences, um, uh, informed by bird watching. Now, as Rick mentioned, I have had the luck and opportunity to work on lots of things in, in, in evolutionary biology, focusing on birds. And in, indeed, I've, in, in recent years, I've come to think of uh, ornithology as really more like avian area studies. <laughs> it, sometimes it's physics, sometimes it's game theory, sometimes it's genetics, uh, and it's always about collaboration uh, with other kinds of academics. 
Uh, but um, in recent years, I've, I've also realized that, that a lot of the previous work I'd done in evolutionary biology was about a critical question, and that was uh, the beauty of birds. And by the beauty of birds, I don't mean the beauty as we perceive it, but beauty as the birds themselves perceive it. And, and really surrounding the, the scientific idea that birds are beautiful because they're beautiful to themselves and that they are agents through their social and sexual choices in their own evolution. And that this, uh, this uh, agency uh, should be observed or should be uh, uh, discussed as an aesthetic process. So this has led to uh, an appeal and development for an aesthetic kind of science. This aesthetic science or science of the aesthetic is really about uh, this uh, moving the subjective experiences of animals from the margins of uh, evolutionary biology and, 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 and sexual biology to the central uh, focus of the discipline. And here we have, uh, you know, uh, a, a variety of vertebrates with wildly different ways of constructing or experiencing the world. The sonar world of the bat, the incredible olfactory world of the mole, and in the lower uh, left, the, the more mirrored fish, which senses the world in electric fields and actually sings electrical songs that vary in tempo and in frequency, it, like music, but in an entirely different way that's insensible. Uh, to us, right? This, uh, of course, the bird uh, communicates in vision and acoustically, uh, primarily, uh, sensory modalities that we relate to a lot. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why birds are maybe more tractable for this work. But it's really about the, all these varieties uh, of, of, of subjective experience. Now, in uh, trying to create a science of, uh, of, uh, of aesthetics, uh, and, and, and aesthetic evolution, uh, I needed to um, come up with an explicit definition. So here I, I'm proposing it. Aesthetic evolution is an emergent consequence of sensory perception, cognitive evaluation, and choice. And when those uh, evaluation and choices are made on a heritable substrate, then the result is the evolution of aspects of the phenotype that function through the perception and cognitive evaluations of other individuals. And this very open-ended space, this open-ended opportunity creates a kind of watershed in evolution where we see in contrast, for example, of the roots of the plant, we see the, the iris flower here, um, it uh, evolving in, 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 res in, in response to the subjective experiences inside uh, you know, the, 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 the brains and, and physiology of of, of pollinating insects and, 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 and birds, right? So this is the, the, the realm that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm addressing in the book. And then of course, to bring beauty back into the sciences, I need a, uh, uh, a, a, a definition as well. And ever since uh, Kant and, and even going back to Plato, defining the beautiful has been a real challenge. And uh, to me, uh, a, a scientifically progressive and culturally useful uh, way to do that is to describe beauty as a co-evolved attraction in which the form of the desire or preference and the object of preference have shaped one another over time. And that encompasses both the cultural uh, and the genetic mechanisms of, of this kind of mutual co-evolution. So this is how I, uh, how I frame it in, 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 in a scientific way. Now, uh, I, you can't talk about beauty without uh, a birds without a few examples. And here I want to start with uh, Superb bird of paradise. Like all the birds I've shown today, this is a polygynous species. The female does all the nesting and visits males who display uh, and, and chooses uh, uh, her mate based on uh, her subjective experiences of their, prefer of their display. So here, this male has transformed himself in an amazing way through uh, erecting a hood or a, a surface of feathers that include uh, photonic uh, uh, melanin arrays within the barbules to make those blue colors, and a super black plumage surrounding it uh, that we recently described, uh, a kind of structural absorption creating a black that is uh, among the uh, darkest objects uh, ever measured and, and rivaling modern technology. And I'm gonna show that again, because why not? <laughs> so, um, as we look at this, we uh, are forced to grapple with the challenge of beauty to biology. How do we explain uh, the investment, the transformation, uh, the uh, unbelievably detailed diversity of, of ornament in nature? 
Well, and here we come to uh, the problem that, 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 uh, that Rick alluded to and the central issue in the book. And, and that is that the vast majority of my colleagues in evolutionary biology believe that beauty, such as the superb bird of paradise, functions as a kind of biological match.com profile, communicating information that uh, mates need to know. Who are his people? Does he come from a good egg? Uh, does he eat well? Does he take care of himself? Does he smoke? Uh, what is he smoking, right? These are all things that individuals might need to know, and, and these are practical. But this concept uh, takes beauty in nature and creates a kind of utility. And uh, what I uh, apply in or pursue in much of my work and in the book is an alternative authentically Darwinian idea that these, uh, these traits can be beautiful, merely beautiful and, uh, and arbitrary, including no information about quality, merely of co-evolving with a preference. And these are not to say that they're dishonest. Uh, that is that there's nothing to be honest about, uh, only the opportunity to be preferred or not. This is another uh, central character in the book and also an important character in, in Darwin's uh, Descent of Man. And this is the Argus pheasant. Argus pheasant uh, uh, um, lives in Southeast Asia and is again, another polygynous bird. This is a, a video taken uh, by, uh, oh, in, in a zoo in Indonesia. And, and there we can see the male who is about six feet long and has a, a mostly brown, uh, but highly vermiculated plumage. And then the female who is, uh, 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 doesn't lack his uh, ornamented feathers. In a moment, you'll see that he's transformed in another extraordinary way. Uh, this was a, one of the early uh, researchers described this as the blown out umbrella display, right? Uh, and, and Darwin uh, obsessed and very concerned with, you know, how, how could this happen? What you see is that on the secondary feathers that form the top part of this cone suspended over the female or to the side of the female's head, you see a series of, of, of uh, golden spheres um, each one of them is pigmented with a, with a white highlight at the top, a secular highlight like the shine on an apple that tells you that it's round. In addition, a, 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 a dark smudge below, which acts, it looks like a shadow, creating the optical illusion of, of three-dimensionality, right? It's the challenge of this and other kinds of complex characters to, uh, to, um, the, um, to be explained by uh, adaptive signaling that is, is really uh, central to the book. Uh, and uh, here we see those feathers in, 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 uh, in, in detail, showing this uh, uh, marvelous highlight and, 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 and deep smudge that create the optical illusion. Now, there's no reason that this particular uh, uh, um, morphology uh, should be um, more or less genetically difficult or challenging or indicate quality in any way uh, other than, uh, or, or than, than other equally detailed features. However, this one has the special feature that it is uh, 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 amazing to look at, right? That it is uh, uh, essentially uh, beautiful, right? And uh, so this optical illusion, I think is a kind of example of, the, of, of, of a trait that's difficult to explain by anything other than uh, an authentically Darwinian arbitrary mechanism. Now, if we look at the feathers uh, in more detail, we see that the, um, the, 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 the eye spots or ocelia as they're called, uh, are small at the base of the feather and increase in size toward the tip. Uh, and this could be simply allometry, right? You, the scaling, the size of the ornament with the size of the, of, of the feather itself. But if we look on the right from the foreshortened direction of the female, of view, point of view from the female, um, taking her situated perspective, if you will, uh, where the bottom of the feather is closer to her eye than the top of the feather, you see that the spheres all converge uh, uh, on the same size. So these uh, amazing ornaments are uh, actually uh, 300 golden balls uh, you know, uh, suspended in the air uh, all of a similar size. So this is the kind of, of, uh, of uh, sweet spot that is very hard to imagine occurring by um, anything other than an arbitrary or aesthetic uh, uh, mechanism of sexual selection. I'm gonna close with uh, just one of the uh, amazing mannequins, a family I've been studying since, uh, well, since I got out of uh, college in the early 80s. 
Uh, this is the club wing mannequin, which is uh, a bird from the Chocó of Western uh, Colombia and, and, and Ecuador. This is a, a lecking bird. So males gather together and display uh, in separate territories, but aggregated in a, in, in a small arena. The females come and visit the males and, and choose. And they do elaborate displays, including vocalizations and, uh, and songs or calls to, to attract females to, to the display area. And so this male is, is creating his uh, uh, made attraction song. But interestingly, he's not singing the song. This is a wing song. And uh, that's a, a, a fascinating thing because, of course, at this point, before this species and its close relatives evolved, uh, birds have been singing songs for uh, at least 100 million years or maybe, maybe even longer with use a, a novel organ called the syrinx, the, the vocal organ that birds sing. Even though this bird has this rich legacy, he's given up singing with the syrinx and to go in for an entirely new way to communicate. And uh, uh, this is a form of stridulation, uh, like a cricket, where the clubs on the feathers interact to, to create a mechanical force that, that uh, allows this bird to sing. This is an example of showing how uh, beauty is, uh, that is arbitrary and not adapted is not a dead end, but deeply innovative, uh, leading to um, uh, um, uh, what I refer to in the book as aesthetic radiation in conscious con uh, parallel to uh, adaptive radiation fundamental concept in evolutionary biology. And so, uh, a, 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 as, as Rick mentioned, the, one of my mantras in the book is beauty happens, uh, and uh, focusing in particular on the aesthetic agency uh, uh, of mate choice. And with that, I'll be happy to, uh, to turn to uh, discussion and questions. Thank you very much, Rick. That was fabulous. It's now my great pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Eric Jarvis to join you in discussing your research on the science of beauty. Dr. Jarvis received his bachelor's degree in biology and mathematics from Hunter College. He earned his PhD here at Rockefeller in 1995 for research conducted in the laboratory of Dr. Fernando Notabom, where he studied genes linked to vocalization in canaries. In 1998, he joined Duke University, where he was promoted to professor before ultimately being recruited back to Rockefeller in 2016, where he's now head of the Laboratory of Neurogenetics of Language and is an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Eric studies the molecular and genetic mechanisms that underlie vocal learning using songbirds as model organisms. Songbirds are one of the few animals who, like humans, are capable of vocal learning, making them particularly useful in understanding how the brain generates, perceives, and learns complex behaviors. Combining computational, behavioral, and physiological and molecular techniques, findings from Eric's comparative studies suggest that brain pathways for vocal learning likely evolved from a motor circuit common to all vertebrates. By harnessing new technologies and techniques to elucidate this complex behavior, Eric is further exploring how neural circuits form during learning. Please join me in welcoming Eric. Thank you, uh, Rick, for that introduction. And uh, well, Rick Lifton, and thank you, Rick Prum, for a, a wonderful book and a, a wonderful presentation. And um, as Rick knows, Rick from now called from Rick from now on is the uh, uh, we're actually been long-term colleagues and we have a lot of overlapping interests, as you imagine, uh, studying birds. Uh, I actually got into them studying because of their brains, not so much because of their looks. Um, but, uh, you know, I can see why uh, it's actually valuable for both. And uh, so what we're going to do is um, have about, you know, uh, 10 to 15 minutes or so of conversation here and then we'll open it up for questions on the floor. And uh, Really, I, 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 you know, reading through the book and like wondering, well, my goodness, how did you have the time to do all of this, right? And the second is, um, like, where did these ideas come from? But, and how did you challenge, you know, uh, I guess the post-Darwinian revolution? And so uh, th that's not my real question to you. Those are, those are more philosophical, but a, a real, um, you know, pointed question is, you <clears throat> kind of say that, um, natural selection and sexual selection are independent mechanisms as opposed to what many scientists say that they're interrelated. 
And I have one question is one proposed interrelatedness uh, is to whether or not that has really been challenged in the literature or not. So the idea is symmetry, that uh, beauty is uh, the more symmetrical you are or the more symmetrical face you are in humans, uh, the more beautiful you appear to humans. And this I heard is done in surveys and so forth, which and then is a reflection of your uh, genetics or your developmental trajectory. Did something go wrong or did you have some gene that created this asymmetry and less healthier? And so I'm wondering, has that theory been debunked according to what you're saying or, or is there some dependencies in some traits and not in other traits? Yes, well, uh, thank you, Eric. Um, you know, uh, the theory of symmetry is a classic example, I think, of, uh, of what I refer to in the book as a zombie idea. Right and uh, you know shamelessly uh, co-opted from uh, Paul Krugman in economics, right? Uh, but uh, um, and and many of the adaptive mate choice ideas have this form. It turns out that uh, although the first data were sort of drawn from Drosophila studies, the first application of of of, of symmetry to mate choice and to aesthetic choice uh, actually was in ornithology, where people thought, well, you know, the if you have uh, an ornament, then the uh, the symmetry of that ornament uh, will indicate your genetic uh, coherence, your, your, your ability. And, and there was no mechanistic understanding of this, uh, but it uh, produced a lot of papers and a lot of excitement. Well, it turns out that this uh, colonized, uh, you know, psychology and evolutionary psychology, specific uh, human uh, biology. And, uh, but uh, in the meanwhile, it collapsed in ornithology. Uh, the entire field uh, turned out to, to was not repeatable. Uh, the idea of fluctuating asymmetry as an indicator of quality uh, died, that field. And there were even papers on why were we so convinced and how did these, uh, they, and, and whole methods that were developed to look at meta-analysis uh, of, the, of these papers, right? It, it was even featured in a New Yorker on, uh, you know, the failure of science, right? Yeah. So uh, unfortunately, this idea has yet to die. And the, uh, there are lots of pictures of uh, beautiful people that are highly symmetrical. Uh, you know, you find a picture of Haley Berry and many others, but, but you know, I'm really convinced that if you, if you tried even a little bit, you'd find all kinds of symmetrically unattractive people, right? Now, the thing about uh, the most symmetrical thing, of course, is a sphere. And, uh, you know, spherical faces are, are not considered among the most attractive. Uh, and, and, uh, and of course they would provide the most dimensions for actually being symmetrical, right? Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, according to that theory, we should all be like spherically vigorous. And, and of course that doesn't really uh, indicate anything about what, what beauty is really like. I so uh, unfortunately it hasn't yet died in evolutionary psychology, uh, but I think it's on its way. Interesting, interesting. Um, I was also thinking about something actually uh, Jesse Osabel had written about a few years ago uh, about the beauty of flowers and why, you know, things are beautiful as well. And so I'm just wondering, you know, mo most of your examples are about animals and about animals that can see. And you have some examples like in this case of, of vocalizations or singing being beautiful, right? But flowers, do flowers see each other or is it, you know, in, well, you know, the, the, you know uh, once nature has eyes, and that is the sensory part, and you've got cognitive evaluation and choices, then you can create, then beauty can happen. And in the case of, of pollination and frugivory, the agency is animals interacting with the plants. So from the plant's perspective, it's about sex, but from the animal's perspective, it's about nutrition and ecological opportunity. So, you know, uh, there is a large uh, similar literature in pollination in particular, uh, 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 imagining the flower as an honest advertisement of the quality of the reward. Uh, but, you know, um, it, I think that fails to explain the world. There are some pollinators that are very tightly uh, co-evolved with a single species, yucca and yucca moth, right? Uh, but for the most part, a, a lot of the pollinators you think of bees and, and birds are generalists. Uh, so um, if, if uh, you know, if the, if the, if the pollinator was somehow, or the plant was somehow, you know, pushing the psychological buttons and uh, of that bee, in, invoking it to, 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 to feed, uh, then all flowers would converge on hitting that most effective button, which would mean that flowers would all look the same, of course, which would defeat the flower, which wants to carry its pollen from one, ver one member of its species to another individual of the same species, right? So uh, aesthetic evolution of flowers is really about choices. If humming, if bumblebees and 
honeybees, we're not getting up in the morning and making choices about, do I feed on that flower, which is like a potato chip. It's, 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 it's good, it's there, I don't mind it, but it's not the, the, you know, the real a choice thing that I want, right? And, and, and there, so since, since organisms are making choices, then flowers are beautiful. And that explains why the world looks the way it does, which is diverse. And so so a, a flower is like a Coke can. You know, nothing on the Coke can tells you what the experience is like of, of feeding on that flower. Well, let, me, let me just get a clarification here. But you think besides humans and domesticating, you know, beautiful flowers, do you think non-human animals are selecting flowers to feed from and so forth because of they think they're beautiful? No, but they, 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 they are memorably rewarding. And certainly that is associated, nobody doubts that the, that the bee is positively associating with the signal. So, you know, memorably rewarding, uh, uh, it is genuinely rewarding and it's and 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 they're returning to it with uh, with 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 motivation now uh, you know it, 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 we don't have any better way to understand uh, even among humans uh, mm -hmm. other people's subjective experiences than that and we shouldn't uh, I don't think consign uh, animals to uh, uh, to a lower uh, uh, realm of cognitive experience merely because we can't talk to them right uh, and, and that's certainly true of, you know, uh, of, of birds. And I think it's true of, 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 of bees as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. By the way, I, I, keep, I kept writing, I kept writing plants and other aesthetic ex evolution into the book. And my editor strictly and very appropriately said, if it doesn't fit this arc of, you know, the, you know, hundreds of pages where you're going, then, then cut it. And so uh, there were all these beautiful passages about pollinators and fruit okay. but uh, they, they got to be uh, go somewhere else someday. Um, I'm glad I asked. Uh, and I'm glad uh, Jesse uh, reminded me of his, and told me about his uh, essay. Uh, you, do, you do go into, uh, you know, you do talk about humans in the book. Of course, everybody's interested in our own beauty, right? And, um, and do point out the difference, as, as some have noted, that in the animal world, uh, oftentimes it's the males that have the, you know, the uh, complex and interesting, let's call them beautiful displays, like you showed in these male birds. But in humans, uh, at least culturally, uh, it's uh, women who are looked at more to manifest beautiful as opposed to men. So, and you, I, I'm not quite sure, I, I didn't quite understand in the book and sort of why do you think that's the case? Is that a biological difference in humans or is this a cultural difference that we're fighting against some biological difference? Right, with right, 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 right. Well, for, first on the animal kingdom, I focus a lot on, on female choice because those are the conditions under which uh, sexual selection acts in the most extreme way, right? The most aesthetically extreme organisms, and, and, and like these birds of paradise and bower birds and, and mannequins that we've seen. Um, however, there are plenty of other birds that, that have mutual mate choice. Think of a puffin or a penguin, right? Both animals are bright and they're both uh, displaying in mutual, a mutual way. Those are mutual sexual selection. And there are actually species where the, the females are beautiful, sing the songs, larger in body size and have weapons. Like a jacana, uh, and so uh, and where the, the the that is turned around in the nat in the natural world. Now, in humans, yes, the last third of the book is about uh, human sexuality and its evolution. Um, my 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 rules on talking about human sexuality are the following: one, you can't do it quickly, <laughs> and so two, you always break that rule. <laughs> I'm always, but uh, one, why is that? Well, it, it, it's complicated. Humans have male mate choice, female mate choice. Um, uh, male-male competition and female-female competition. You have uh, sexual conflict uh, and coercion uh, about both males and females. And then on top of that, you have culture. So this is like, you know, the full Monty. It is the most complicated thing, but you can't dip in and out responsibly most of the time, right? However, what I, what I can't say is that, um, you know, um, Many features of both the male and female human body um, likely evolved by sexual selection that had to have been, I think, mate choice on the part of males and the part of females. And I, and I, and I, I talk about uh, uh, those examples in, in, in detail. Uh, I think most of that, sorry? When you say sexual selection, I'm- yeah, I mean, mate choice. Right, mate choice, but you mean sexual selection for something beautiful or something else? 
Well, uh, that's uh, I argue at length in the book about about these details, right? Of course, um, uh, of course, uh, beauty applies to 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 the adaptive uh, beauty as well. I mean, I think even if it's an adaptive ornament, uh, an indicator of quality, it's still beautiful. It's still co-evolving, right? And so, uh, um, a Maserati or a Rolex could be, you know, uh, beautiful as well as highly functional, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, uh, the the best way to contrast them would be arbitrary, having no correlation with other information or, 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 or honest or somehow adaptive, right? Um, uh, I, you know, the huge cottage industry, the whole discipline of evolutionary psychology is focused on, on, um, on uh, you know, adaptive explanations of, uh, of human uh, evolution. And, and I think they really have missed the boat uh, in, in terms of, uh, of human ornament. Right. Mm, okay. So I argue that they're vastly arbitrary. I also argue that that, you know, uh, another feature of the book is to talk about sexual autonomy and, uh, and and the evolution of those female behaviors that that further or eliminate or defend against coercion, sexual coercion. And so I think that process uh, has been important in human evolution as well. All right. Um, just a few more questions from uh, folks who contacted us in advance and then we'll get to the folks online. Uh, so one from the development office here at Rockefeller, how did Darwin's theory of sexual selection by mate choice come to be treated as a dangerous idea? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I, I, I skipped over that history in my little comments, but, but really, um, it was immediately a dangerous idea. I uh, mean, Darwin, after the origin of species, had three persistent problems, you know, no theory of genetics, no articulated theory of uh, human evolution and no uh, explanation of what he called impracticable beauty, uh, you know, things like the peacock's tail. And, and uh, what, he, what, he, uh, uh, what he did instead of resting on his laurels as, you know, the most successful and famous Victorian scientist, period, uh, he, 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 in a decade or so, he wheeled around in a very foxy way and created a new book, The Descent of Man, which addressed two of these issues, um, the uh, origin of humans and and, and, and the origin of beauty. And uh, it, 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 in there, he, uh, he, he proposed an explicitly um, a, a aesthetic theory that uh, choice, in particular female choice, was a force in nature. Uh, he also proposed that male-male competition was a, a force in nature. And of course, that idea was so congruent with Victorian era that it uh, was immediately a winner. But his idea of, of, of mate choice, in particular female mate choice, uh, was a big loser. Uh, mm -hmm. The immediate response was to critique it as, uh, and those critiques were immediately, were, uh, uh, those immediate critiques uh, had a, a misogynistic element that continued uh, essentially for the next century, right? Uh, yeah. And so uh, Darwin's idea of aesthetic made choice was drummed out of science. Uh, the most effective uh, person in that debate was Alfred Russell Wallace, who basically said, uh, and he articulated the biomesh.com profile idea that, that, that if beauty, the only way to beauty could exist is if it included information about quality and fitness and survival. And so therefore it was a way of taking this dangerous idea of, of aesthetics and desire and a natural explanation of passion, right? And pleasure and putting it under control of a rationalizing force of natural selection. Right. And, 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 and that uh, that uh, that anxious distance from from sexual pleasure that the Victorians, uh, you know, instituted in science became the objective stance of modern science. So that today uh, we we can't talk about, you know, animal subjectivity or um, uh, uh, topics uh, in the book. There's a whole chapter on the evolution of orgasm talking about the insufficiency of adaptive explanations uh, for the evolution of pleasure. Right, and so so uh, the aesthetic, I think, uh, addresses that, and um, uh, it's still a dangerous idea. I'm sure there are many people in the audience that were that would uh, that would uh, uh, question whether uh, taking you know subjective uh, uh, experience and free will of animals seriously in science it is a good idea so it, it remains dangerous and uh and, and what you know in the in the t full title of the book the forgotten uh darwin's forgotten theory what's forgotten is that those were those were those were darwin's ideas that he was not just adaptationist he was uh, strongly advocated other forces in this case uh, natural se sexual selection that's independent from natural selection yeah, I think you do a pretty good job on the history of this whole subject there and, uh, and you know, Darwin's uh, views and other people's views. For the future, I'd like to see the, the neurobiology of beauty, what that looks like. 
Well, let, let's let's go to uh, some folks online here who have questions. Uh, so Lance Langston asks, while listening to your description of the evolution of beauty, I was struck by the parallels to the power of images in human culture. And I wondered if you have interacted with experts in art and art history to get their take on the correspondence between the role of imagery in art and nature. So basically beauty in art. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, not that specifically, but uh, I have actually gotten involved in thinking about and writing aesthetic philosophy. The, I, I started by looking toward uh, art and art history, philosophy of art and art history, for kind of allies that I could use in my discussion about uh, the arbitrary as a source of of, of, of the beautiful and the co-evolved as a source of the beautiful. And um, I, I found aesthetic philosophy to be a very confused place. There wasn't a lot that people agreed upon, except that they weren't gonna disagree so strongly that they would that the field would collapse, right? It, a lot of dissension. Uh, and then uh, somehow or other, uh, after reading uh, Arthur Danto uh, and the art world, a famous uh, set of analyses of Brillo Box by, by, uh, by Andy Warhol, um, I reached the hubris moment where I thought, hey, wait a minute, I think I could add to this. So I'm uh, actually, you know, publishing in aesthetic philosophy. I have a paper out in biology and philosophy in 2013 on a co-evolutionary uh, theory of, of art. And uh, this is kind of a post-human move. I define art as a form of communication that co-evolves with its evaluation. And that means that it is not just a, a human enterprise. Uh, but is something that exists in the natural world. Uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, some of the biggest fans of the book are actually in the humanities, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is a delight to me. Uh, and um, uh, so I'm very actively engaged in that. And of course, there are others as well that are applying adaptive, uh, adaptationist ideas that, uh, to, to art. And uh, so there's this parallel uh, debate that's extending up in, into into the human arts. Well, well, I think we're already seeing your next book is heading, or some or something at least, some stories. So, uh, I'll be chase here, going back to the flowers. So, uh, you mentioned that the appearance of the flowers is related to pollinators choosing the blooms in order to feed. Uh, well, I guess you got to have to say that's correct or not. How do you fold uh, into um, that idea, the flowers look very different to us because bees can see in the ultraviolet. Sure, um, you know, um, uh, the, the, and obviously we're not seeing exactly the patterns they do, but but birds are, are bees are trichromatic. They have a lot more sensitivity in the UV than we do. So some of those uh, patterns are cryptic to us. Uh, however, uh, you know, they are um, uh, using lots of uh, colors that are that are that are easily sensible uh, or directly sensible to us. So we're not seeing the same beauty as as the pollinators, as the bees, and certainly in birds who who are tetrachromatic and seeing the ultraviolet, a whole other set of uh, of similar questions. So we grapple with that. Uh, what do what do what does the beauty of birds look like to the birds themselves in, in, in our own work? Um, um, uh, so we're getting an incomplete view. Uh, we're not getting the same view, but that's the same as uh, uh, you and me, right? We all have distinct and individual views, and and recognizing that and not being afraid of it is, is I think, part of the, uh, you know, uh, is the bench. So when we do this, we would have to have a situated perspective of, the, you know, try to get something like uh, understanding what birds are uh, or bees are seeing as as independent from what we're seeing. And that would be part of a, a scientific study. of. of that that of sounds like a, a nice one. So uh, Titi Delange uh, asks here, uh, ducks have the greatest ploy to protect against getting impregnated by males they don't like. Well, I guess it depends on what duck species, according to your book. Right. Uh, uh, when will human females evolve this trick? <laughs> I uh, can't wow. wait, uh, given the recent new abortion laws in the South. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a whole lot there. Uh, um, so maybe for those who haven't read the book, the, uh, the, 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 the question refers to um, uh, the issue of sexual conflict in, in ducks and to the, uh, the, uh, the fascinating and truly problematic topic of, uh, of duck sex, right? It's all made possible by the fact that ducks still have a penis the penis evolved in the common ancestor of reptiles and amphibians. And so the duck penis is actually homologous with the human penis, but very, very different. Uh, it has lymphatic erection, which is nearly instantaneous. Um, and um, 
and, 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 and rapid. So um, what Patty Brennan at uh, Mount Holyoke showed in, in, working in my lab or collaboration with me originally and, and continued uh, was that um, in response to uh, forced copulations in, uh, in ducks, many species independently and multiple species independently of ducks have co-evolved complicated vaginal morphologies that exclude the penis during forced copulation. This is basically like an FDA approvable birth control device that the female can behaviorally deploy uh, when uh, she is uh, you know, essentially raped outside of the context of her, of her pair bump, which she has uh, positively chosen. So duck species can't mitigate the direct harm of sexual violence, but they can control uh, extensively who is the father of their offspring. And we know this because in species where 30 to 50% of the copulations are forced, only two to 5% of the offspring in the eggs in the nest are actually sired outside of the pair. So that means they are really uh, uh, good at doing this, right? Um, and so this speaks to something deeply important, I think, which is that uh, sexual autonomy matters to animals, right? There is something it is like to have freedom of choice and, 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 and female ducks, and there, and there are evolutionary forces when it's abridged. And so female ducks have evolved to reinforce their capacity to get what they want. Now, um, uh, this situation is a desperate uh, you know, arms race in, in, in many duck species. It, ecological situations can take, create the opportunity and it's not going anywhere. So uh, humans, I think, have taken a very different path and I think it's still an active path, and that is, what I call uh, aesthetic remodeling. That is using male, or using female mate choice to change maleness in ways that are correlated uh, with uh, lowered uh, coercion. That is remodeling of, 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 of the humans. And if you look at our, our, uh, our, you know, our, our closest ancestors, the males have deadly weapons in their faces that human males lack. Uh, there's always been an ecological explanation of, for this, but it, it doesn't really make any sense because have been much earlier in the in the in in human and uh, uh, history than 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 the ecological explanation. So uh, I, I propose that that's really about female mate choice uh, and the smile. Well, it's the smile, but you know you're showing you don't have any weapons, right? Uh, so so uh, um, in, in your mouth, right? And so uh, this and 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 body size, for example, are cases where. Uh, I think mate choice uh, by females has transformed maleness in ways that advance. So I don't think that females, humans, are going to evolve what ducks have. Um, but um, I, I think we're going a lot better than that. <laughs> so, so we got uh, one more here uh, from Constantina Theofanopoulou in my lab, actually, uh, and it makes sense. It's coming from my lab because it talks about song learning. So, um, <clears throat> so you have these examples of beauty in nature, like uh, the mannequin dancing. Uh, which includes motor skills on behalf of the subject, you, you know, the words, the bird producing it. So she's wondering if other skills like courtship singing in songbirds, which is also a sensory motor skill, can be perceived as something beautiful, similar to the motor learning, well, we don't know if it's learning, but motor skills of the dancing and the mannequins. Uh, and if so, um, has anybody shown that females can perceive which male uh, songbirds are good singers and that this directly speaks to male fitness, you know, for song and for dancing. Yeah. So, what's your what's your what's your what's your answer on that? The, 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 the context. The, the, yeah, the interesting interesting thing about this, whether it's in a cultural context like avian vocal learning, or in a genetic context, what you have is coevolution that 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 both the uh, the preferences change the songs and novel songs change the capacity or, or what could be preference that that in both genetic and in in uh, cultural uh, um, ornaments uh, the females prefer the ones that they have co-evolved with, right? And that gives rise to things like dialects in, 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 in aesthetic culture. So yes, the, the vocals, vocally learned song are deeply aesthetic and um, you know, efforts to try to make song learning about betterment and improvement uh, have you have, have had real problems, right? Uh, you know, uh, whether it's repertoire size uh, or, 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 or as many other forms, right? In fact, it's just culture happening. It's beauty happening. So yes, it's beautiful. And what, what creates it? Well, it's the crowdsource. It is, it is uh, the population biology of aesthetic uh, choices. 
uh, birds learning their songs, composing a, di a, a, a song or a, di or a, or a, a, a repertoire, females making mate choices uh, uh, over space and time, right? And uh, uh, you know, my dissertation advisor, one of them, uh, Bob Payne, worked on indigo buntings in Michigan for like 25 years and recorded every single bird. And, 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 he, and, he, and he had you know, generations three, four, five generations of who learned from who uh, over the years and how that song changed slightly, right? And what he showed is that, uh, you know, successful males did not sing successful songs. Birds that learned a, a song of a successful male did not inherit any fitness. It was all just uh, culture happening. It was beauty happening and, and, and uh, essentially uh, uncoupled uh, from, uh, from reproductive success. Uh, as measured by number of babies in the nest, right? And so um, uh, that indicates that, uh, you know, culture, uh, cultural evolution of birdsong is a wildly arbitrary and still, uh, uh, you know, marvelously beautiful thing. Something we have to consider. Uh, should I ask this last one here or how we're doing on time? Sure. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to paraphrase it so I can make it sim uh, simpler. Is here is that how deep in the family tree of animals does this um, idea of sexual selection or beauty, you know, selection for beauty go, right? And uh, along with that, how deep is, what is the requirement uh, in terms of sensory perception and other mechanisms in the brain? So, so say that again, sorry, I got distracted in the chat. Yeah, how, how deep in the tree, in the family tree of animals, uh, does sexual selection for beauty go, you know, go, yeah. right? Well, um, um... What kind of cognitive uh, sensory? Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the central nervous system, you know, the hydra. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think that that uh, that the, the capacity for beauty, aesthetic evolution, uh, you know, sensory perception, cognitive evolution, and choice have evolved a myriad of independent times on the on the tree of life. In birds, it, it's clear that it evolved, you know, likely back in the Jurassic. Right. I mean, before the origin of any modern bird lineages, it's just it's such a consistent history of uh, every bird species has some kind of display, right? So it, it goes deeply back. In, in human history, I, I think it's, it's, it's very, very recent. Um, although uh, uh, female uh, great apes of other species, you know, chimpanzees and uh, bonobos and, and, and gorillas have uh, lots of uh, a cognitive capacity for choice, and the chimps and the gorillas have, have no opportunity for choice. Uh, females and in the case of bonobos, uh, they're kind of uh, you know rampantly uh, unpicky, right? So they're not very choosy, uh, and so so as a result, you know, in us, it's very very recent, and I think that uh, you have to go through the tree of life to articulate each one of those, right? Um, and then on neural mechanisms, of course, um, you know that's a that's a that's a difficult hard problem. Uh, we don't know even much about uh, you know. The sensory part, let alone the evaluative part, uh, let alone the choice part. But uh, I think we should uh, not be flat earth about that, but actually recognize that the explanation of native demands that these organisms are making choices and that that, 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 that needs to be part of any, uh, any uh, um, the neural understanding of how it happens. All right, thanks, Rick. Uh, th this is great to have this conversation publicly with you like this. I'll turn it back over to Rick Lifton. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rick and Eric, for that wonderful discussion. I would now uh, like to ask everyone to please join me in congratulating uh, Rick Prum again on this uh, extraordinarily well-deserved uh, award. So until next time, all of us here at Rockefeller hope that uh, you all will stay safe and healthy. And thank you very much for participating this evening. And I wish you all a very good evening.